Welcome, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be the first ones on stage today. But it's also great to see each and every one of you. It, I'm sure you all agree it's been far too long since we've been able to get together and, and, and do these things face to face. And it's been fantastic to see each and every one of you over the last days. And thank you for joining us here today. Um, my name isn't Jamie Cameron, as you probably have come to see Johnson Controls. My name's Bill Alvindani and I look after digital solutions here at uh, Johnson Controls across UK and I. Today, we're going to be sharing with you a few insights from JCI from the front line and what we've seen in the market, speaking to customers and some of the challenges faced when talking about smart buildings. Myself, I've been in the building automation and IoT space my whole career. And it's been fantastic to see the market evolve to where it is today. But really what we're going to share with you today are some of these insights that we've experienced from the front line and what makes a smart building. So today you'll hear from myself and my colleagues, Mark Bolden, who will be talking you through some of our capabilities and Jamie Cameron sharing some of the insights from some of our clients. So today's focus, you know, this might sound like a good starting and an obvious point when we talk about smart buildings, but the challenges from the front line are really some of the areas that we'll be covering throughout the course of today. And it may well be an obvious place to start, but what really constitutes a smart building? And we'll see from the show here today and other exhibitors talking about technologies and innovations. But from a Johnson Controls perspective, there is a perception gap we see in the market, what makes a smart building and, and how that can deliver value for, for our customers and its occupants. And from there, we'll be joined by, by some of our colleagues exploring how Johnson Controls addresses that gap and really what we've delivered to, to some of our clients today. So I'd like to start with the challenge. And you know, when we talk to our customers, because to get to the heart of what organizations are, are trying to achieve, there is a big gap. And JCI have conducted a number of studies more recently, and you can get access to, to our market research by, by visiting our stand. And we can share with you a, a report that covers this approach in more detail, but some interesting stats on the screen. You'll find you know, a lot of companies agree the value and benefit that smart technologies can bring to their organization, to their people, to their operations, and to some of their goals and objectives. But only half really see the value created by some of these smart technologies. And often companies that I meet with sort of have point solutions that will address problems in parts of their organization. And it may well be you know, a good example coming out of the pandemic, trying to make environments safer for people to come in. Organizations will look at indoor air quality monitoring, innovative solutions, wireless sensors deployed, capturing how the spaces are performing in terms of air quality. But really, that doesn't address the full challenge. And that's part of what we're seeing across the market. This siloed approach doesn't always get the results that organizations are looking for. And indeed, you know, the research that we've conducted highlights that from a lot of organizations implementing these solutions over the last years, not getting the full benefit realized from, from what they were expecting. That's one of the main problems that we're trying to solve. So what do we actually mean when we talk about smart buildings? I mean, there are countless conversations um, and a subject that has is, is been going on throughout this conference, and I'm sure you've, you've heard a lot of perspectives on this topic, but I want you to dwell on something for a moment. What the term smart actually really means. And to different people, it can mean a number of different things. You know, a light coming on in a meeting room could be constituted as a smart space, or a mobile app to find your way around a building and book a desk could also be constituted as a smart building. But indeed, all these applications around the built environment, you know, these technologies are seen as point solutions. And as smart solutions, what, what, what does it mean to make it into a smart building? 
In other words, organizations have been focusing on those individual problems and the technologies to, to solve those. And the wider connected building strategies is somewhat missed. To deliver that constitutes bringing a lot of these smart solutions together. And by doing so, you can really start to deliver on new occupant experiences, smarter facilities management, and sustainability goals. The combination of operating technology is really the key. Bringing different systems together and multiple data sources really starts to help drive out more positive outcomes. By doing so, we can help ensure that organizations have got technologies that can help multiple stakeholders when it comes to managing and operating a building because they're so complicated. And by doing so, you can start to drive value to those individual stakeholders. I'm going to now pass off to my colleague, Mark, who will be taking you through what Johnson Controls can really help deliver when it comes to ensuring a building is truly smart. Mark? Thank, thanks a lot, Bill. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, brilliant. Um, so, the point that we want to say is that there's a lot of smart solutions out there delivering silos of data. They're easy to realize, but don't actually deliver the value. So as we can see, we're linking operational technology to IT technology. That's a common message that we see within the field. What we really want to sort of express is what, we're, what our resolute desire is, is to autonomously run the building efficiently. That's the, the goal of our business. And, and, and that means um, fusing a wider data set together. So here we've got technology. What we need to do is, is bring together the building space um, so we need to bring that data in. We need to understand how the people are interacting, not only with the technology, but also with the space. Um, and we need to understand those assets as well, the, the process that's going through those assets. So not just what assets are there, but what, what are they actually doing? So understand the business process. So that's fusing quite complicated data together. And the way that we do that, so we've really got four areas of data. We call it the space data or the location information. We've got the, um, the, the, the elements that are happening with the building, the process elements, the sensory elements, the conditions. We've got the actual physical assets, the, the things that are in the building. And then we've got the, the interaction with the people, the way that the people. And how do, we, how do we do this? Well, we form a twin, a twin of what the building is doing a real-time model of the building. Now, we've had twins in building for a long time. Um, the, that, that twin technology exists within a BIM, but it really only takes a building from concept to commissioning, and then it gathers dust. So a twin takes that data and moves it on to be value in operation. Um, and that's um, where we are working, and we're not working in the same siloed way that we used to work. We're working in partnership with other organizations to de develop an open standards-based approach. Um, so we're, we're working um, with a number of organizations, but the basis of our twin is formed around a different data schema. Um, traditionally in buildings, we've stuck with SQL models, which are relationship databases, and they're very, very inflexible. We're now moving into um, what we call knowledge graphs uh, or semantic web databases, which enables us to fuse all of these different types of data together in a very, very flexible, extendable way. So that's, that's really important because bringing the space data or the location-based data, which is the L in the leap, the events that are happening, which is the business process and, and, and the sensory data that's happening, the assets, which are the things within the building, and then the people into one um, data construct. It's very difficult from a, an SQL perspective or a traditional, even a traditional no SQL tagging perspective, such as Haystack, which is an, another data analytics algorithm. So, we're all, so we, need, we need to make something that's very flexible and very extensible to be able to get that real-time twin. Um, 
then we need something that can be abstracted. In other words, we've got applications that we need to build on top, and they need to be able to work and be portable across many buildings. And buildings, as we know, are completely unique. Um, the, the physical dimensions, the location, the equipment that goes in them, the way people use them, even the naming schema of the building, it ends up that the building's completely unique. So we, we take one application and we move it to another building, and it won't work very well because all of the naming convention's wrong. Everything's off. So we then need to re-engineer that application to make it work. We, we need to abstract, similar to TCP IP and computing, or USB and sort of connected devices. We need to abstract the building from the data analytics and the applications. And that's where we talk about this common data model. So as I said, we're working in an open way now, completely different to the way that we, the organization used to work. And we're working with people like IBM, the Department of Energy. Um, several different organizations are cottoned on to the same idea. And we're working with a number of universities. And we've developed a data schema, which is called BRIC. It's an open ontology. It's a naming classification system. And it allows us to use that graph database in a standardized way and abstract our applications. And that means we can apply artificial intelligence. And that's how we get to value. So there's a lot of systems out there that are dashboarding. In actual fact, 90% of the, of, the, of the data platforms that we've got out there, all they're doing is dashboarding data and giving you a wonderful graphic about what happened historically. What we, what we need to do is develop applications that can develop predictive models to then optimize the building. And that's how we get to autonomous building running. And we've, we've done it. We've done it in certain ways. We've got model predictive control over systems now running the plant autonomously, set point control autonomously, and we do it more efficiently than the human, or we do it more efficiently than the building management systems can do it and be programmed to do it. And what does that give? Sustainability. It gives predictive maintenance. It provides us with insight to maintain and optimize the platform. So we don't need human interference to run the building. We can actually use AI and machine learning to run the building. So that's, that's how we get to AI and machine learning. What we've done is we've developed an open platform approach as well, and we're working with partners. So, so far, we've got 18 partners, and there are over 350 R&D developers not, don't work for us. They work for other companies like Accenture, like Atos. We've just signed up and released Atos, are looking at um, environmental ESG goals on top of our platform. But really, we need to start. Everybody tends to start at the bottom. What have you got? And work up. What we need to do is start at the top, which is applications and outcomes. What are you, what are you trying to achieve? Which is things like, we, well, we, we, generically, we're looking to achieve net zero, sustainability. We've got a sustainability goal. Right now, let's identify the data we require to sort of obtain that goal. Rather than start off with the siloed approach, start off with the outcome. And then what we do is we enrich that data through um, the twin which is, again, open standards based. And this is where the common data model comes in. So having a standard abstraction model enables other application providers to also understand that data and build applications very quickly. Um, we then host this in the cloud. Now, some of this doesn't need to be cloud hosted, but we, we have cloud hosting. And when you build the cloud environment um, that runs things like device management or security and access control, but we put it in a container so we can lift and shift that cloud from Azure to AWS to Google to Alibaba, whatever the cloud provider is, even taking it into private cloud if they, if they need to. So it's a cloud container that enables us to sort of port, make it portable. And then finally, um, we need to connect to the devices. So again, we've developed a bridge that enables us secure connectivity both, in both directions and enables us to talk standard protocols. So we've got about 10 standard protocols from BACnet, Modbus, OPA, um, MQTT, all of the different ones that you'd expect, as well as a, it's developed on a microservices basis, so a Kubernetes or a Docker container that enables us to spin up new applications within the bridge. So actually, we can run AI within the bridge and, and do autonomous set point control over the plant within this, within this device. That enables us, as well, at each and every level, to share an API. So we've got APIs on every one of these uh, 
at every one of these levels that we're working with partners on. Um, so you can go onto our website and request an API membership and say, actually, we've got a development that we want to share with Johnson Controls, and therefore this open community of developers sort of extends our buildings. And this, what we're trying to get away from is silos in our building and make, make best use of um, the intelligence that we've got within our community. So we've already got 18 manufacturers there um, working on that platform. So ending on this, we need to focus on the outcomes, not the, we, every, everybody had a solution. You, uh, you know, back, back for the last 20 years, I've seen solutions for everything. Everybody's talking about solution selling. What we're trying to concentrate on is outcomes. And this is, a, this is really a journey that we're on as well. It will always be advancing. So we're really in the world of uh, you know, IoT, big data, AI, and machine learning now. Buildings are really there. And, and to take and gain those sustainability advantages, we've got to change the way that we deliver buildings. We've got to change the way that we operate buildings to be able to run. Because if we look at the what, sustainability is a problem, we look at specifically where we are now, and we know where we need to be, we can't do operate buildings in the same way. We need to improve that operational efficiency to gain those um, energy reductions and carbon, carbon reductions. And obviously, occupational savings they, they really come from things like predictive maintenance, less truck rolls. Our entire business is transforming uh, in, in industry 4.0. We want to do less truck rolls. We don't want to go to site to fix a system. We want to use a predictive maintenance. If we do need to go to site, we need to send this engineer to site with the right kit so he fixes it first time and it doesn't fail again. But we use, need to use analytics on our platform to feed back also into our research and development as well to improve our product development as well. So there's a number of things that we're, we're doing there. Um, in terms of applications that we've built on, on top of the platform, we already have a, a mobile application that interacts, and again, we, we, there's a quid pro quo benefit of, of the mobile app, is that it benefits the user as well as benefiting um, other people in the business. And this is part of what we call data democratization. So it's not just a mobile app for the user. There are benefits to facilities, security, um, all different users from the mobile app. Um, we have an enterprise management application which really binds together sustainability, occupancy, and air quality to drive those energy costs down, but also increase and improve and have a healthy building environment. Central utility plant is a, a, a absolutely brilliant use case of machine learning. We can run the plant more efficiently by using a thing called model predictive control. We have modeled it, we've developed it, we're running it. We've got over 50 buildings now um, around the world where we're running the plant using um, machine learning, model predictive control, and they run far more efficiently with that against sort of a modern building management system um, set point control. Um, we're connecting all of our equipment. We're on a journey. We haven't connected it all yet. Everything that we sell, though, will have a connected framework around it to improve its operations. So we have uh, connected chillers, connected refrigeration, and it's remote, remote servicing, predictive maintenance, all of those things. And we have a, also a platform of security technologies as well that look at risk and also standard operational procedures. With that, I'm going to hand over to Jamie Cameron that's going to talk about some of our customers. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks, Ben Alpha, for uh, earlier. So just before I dive into some live examples, because I thought it would be useful to talk about a couple of projects that I've worked on and just explain a little bit about what we've done with some, some real-life customers, um, I just want to highlight one thing on the OpenBlue platform. It's completely technology agnostic. So it's, as Mark um, said, it's built on open standards and for any system. So it's not, we're not looking at just Johnson Controls uh, operational technology, but all manufacturers' operational technology, and looking to drive efficiencies into into those um, into those platforms. So I'm going to I'm going to dive into a couple of uh, real life examples that I've 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 worked on myself. The um, the first that I'll talk about is uh, Derwent London um, about some work that we've done with them over the last 18 months around getting the full picture and um, the the uh, the program that we're going on with them over the next couple of years. The next I'm going to talk about is beer because I think it's um, 
it's really it's a really interesting case study. It's a um, management uh, waste management company in the Middle East, and they've truly developed the what I believe is the world's smartest building. So we work very closely with Microsoft, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the stuff uh, that we've done there. And then the final piece that I'm going to talk about is uh, Royal Bank of Canada and um, and their new office at 100 Bishopsgate and some of the things that we've been doing with uh, with RBC. The next um, the next project that I want to talk about is um, is beer. So again, as I said earlier, their their corporate headquarters in the in the Middle East is a um, a truly amazing place to go. We, worked, um, we work closely with uh, Microsoft. So Microsoft is, um, is one of our partners and they, they came to us and said, we want to we wanna make the world's smartest building. So, so we, worked, um, we worked with Microsoft and, and Beer and, the, and the, the fundamental goal was all around sustainability. They wanted to create a sustainable future for their environment and have zero carbon emissions. So actually they've managed to reduce their carbon emissions that they're putting they're putting energy, energy back into the grid. They're, they're producing so much. So um, the government is actually paying them to run their building, which is quite a, quite a powerful um, tool. But it's really interesting some of the things that we've done from actually removing the need from security guards and replacing them with drones. So inside the building, they, they, they navigate through and do, um, do all the security sweeps through drones. When you arrive as a visitor, you get met by a, a robot that will take you up to, to your meeting, your facial recognition is already plugged in so that they know that, that I've arrived and, they can, and, and, and your visitor gets that notification and, and you can go and uh, through the app be wayfinded or choose to be taken by, by a robot. So some quite sophisticated things that, um, that we're doing, but these are the sort of the five areas that, um, that beer is focused on. Sustainability being core to everything uh, that we do. Efficiency, so net zero carbon. Um, productivity and comfort, all through using the companion mobile app to, um, to deliver that comfort to, um, to the employees of, um, of beer. Uh, scalability, so um, having a platform that can scale to new use cases. And finally, security, all around real-time visibility of, of the environment. Now, the, 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 final, the final project that I'm going to talk about is um, the Royal Bank of Canada, so um, RBC at, um, at 100 Bishopsgate. 100 Bishopsgate is one of the 15 buildings that we've delivered our companion mobile app into, and uh, the reason for that is that RBC want an efficient, dynamic workplace for, for their occupiers. So they moved into 100 Bishopsgate about two years ago, and wanted a new way of all of their employees interacting with the building. And they do that through Companion. It's a, it's a global deployment, so anyone from RBC that goes to any office um, that has Companion running can get access, can book meeting rooms, can book desks, but it's a whole flexible workplace uh, that we're delivering or that we've delivered for, um, for RBC. And, and, and really, it's around a user journey. It's a journey of arriving at the office and being able to tap in on your phone to, to get into the building. And then when you're there, being able to order uh, drinks to, to your desk so you don't actually have to leave the trading floor because you, you can do that delivery um, and, and have, have the food brought to you. The, the idea of being able to book a meeting room, find colleagues, open, unlock lockers, find bike stations, and uh, find just-in-time spaces, all at the click of the button through the mobile app. So we use Companion to do that. It's, 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 it's a Johnson Controls app, but it's delivered as a fully, you know, if you were to go onto the App Store and download RBC Workplace, you'd see it's powered by Johnson Controls, but looks like and feels like an RBC's own app. So I wanted to just um, you know, give you a bit of an example of some of the projects that we're working on and, and hopefully bring some of the smart building technology to life for, for you guys to, um, to see and to, um, to really um, see that there are people out there doing stuff. It's not, it's not sort of just theoretical. There are customers that, um, that we're on a, a journey with and delivering their sustainability goals.